So on the one hand, we kind of know what the determinant is telling us. We invented the determinant to tell us exactly when a matrix is invertible. So a, a, a matrix is invertible if and only if its determinant is non-zero. But, you know, when we actually compute the determinant, we don't just get a yes or no answer, we actually get a number, right? We get a numerical value. It might be zero, but if it's not zero, um, it, it could be any real number, you know? And uh, it, it seems like it's, it would be a bit of a shame if the only meaning that the determinant had was whether it's zero or non-zero. Um, it would be a shame if the determinant being one and the determinant being two didn't actually tell you anything about about the matrix. So maybe what we should do is is think a little more carefully about um, about how the determinant comes up with its value or other things that might be related to the value of the determinant. Um, one nice way to think about the value of the determinant is to think in terms of the elementary matrices that make up a, a matrix. So we've seen that uh, for any square matrix A, you can write it as a product of elementary matrices times the reduced row echelon form of A. Um, and uh, this, since the determinant uh, respects products, the product of a determinant is the determinant of the products, uh, we can sort of interpret the value of the determinant by coming up with uh, by uh, looking at the value of the determinants on these elementary matrices. So there are sort of two main cases. So uh, first case is if the reduced row echelon form has a row of zeros. Right. Um, well, in that case, the determinant of A is just z zero, right? The determinant of A is going to be the determinant of all of these elementary matrices times the determinant of R, but uh, the determinant of a, a matrix with a row of zeros is just zero, okay? And notice that, uh, so this means, it, this is the case when the matrix is not invertible, but another way to say that is that the uh, columns of A are linearly dependent. Okay. Uh, the second case, so this was case one, second case is when the reduced row echelon form is just the identity. Okay. So, um, right, in that case, the determinant of A is just the determinant product of the determinants of all of these elementary matrices. Okay. And we know these come in, in sort of three varieties. If a, an elementary matrix is switching a row and a column, then the determinant of that elementary matrix is minus 1. We know if an elementary matrix is multiplying a row by a constant, then that de the determinant of that elementary matrix is just the constant. And if an elementary matrix adds a constant of one row to another row, we know that the determinant of that elementary matrix is uh, one. Okay, um, but let's let's interpret what. Uh, let's interpret what these elementary matrices are doing geometrically. So, right, we're starting with, I guess, maybe here, I, in this case, the reduced row echelon form is the identity. And the identity is, right, its columns are the standard basis vectors, right? One, and then all zeros, and then a zero, and a one, and then all zeros, and so on, until you get zeros, and then a one. And, you know, if we could plot these, I mean, we, we, the biggest picture I can draw is three-dimensional because we live in a three-dimensional uh, space, or three spatial dimensions. Um, so these vector, these standard basis vectors, right, they just look like this. Okay, well, 
let's, to interpret what the determinant of A is, let's see what the elementary, with, let's see what multiplying by an elementary matrix does to this arrangement of vectors. So if we interchange two rows, or interchange two columns, um, maybe, maybe that would be a better way to think about it. Well, here, I can, I can uh, instead of writing the identity as elementary, uh, instead of writing it as a matrix whose columns are the standard basis vector, we can write it as a matrix whose rows are the standard basis vectors. Like this. Okay, and now when we do row operations to this identity, we are um, manipulating the standard basis. So if we interchange a couple rows, that means we're just going to have a couple off diagonal ones like this. Oops, one. And what does that do to the basis? Well, it doesn't actually change the basis, it just sort of changes how they're ordered. Right, so before if we said that this vector was vector number one and this vector was vector number two and this one was vector number three, then after we do this row operation, it just changes the numbering. So now maybe if we interchanged one and two, then this would be ve vector number two, that would be vector number one, and this one is still vector number three. Um, so this doesn't, it doesn't actually change the vectors you have, but it sort of changes kind of, well, it changes something called the orientation. So what's different about these, these two collections of vectors um, is that the one on top follows the right-hand rule. Okay, so first of all, this, vec this second vector here, it's sort of going into the screen. And if you take your right hand, and you take your index, your middle th finger, and your thumb, you can orient your right hand so that uh, your index finger is pointing along the first vector, uh, your middle finger is pointing along the second vector, and uh, your thumb is pointing along the third vector. So uh, these, three, these three vectors, in the way that they're ordered, one, two, and three, follow the right hand rule. Well, if you try to, if you look at the second collection of vectors and try to sort of make your hand point in the correct ways, so put your index finger in the direction of the first vector and then your middle finger in the direction of the second vector, you find that your thumb is actually pointing in the wrong way. Your thumb is not pointing in the direction of the third vector. But if you try to do the same thing with your left hand, it'll work. Now you can put your index finger in the direction of the first vector and then your middle finger and then your thumb in the direction of the third vector. So this second set of coordinate or the second set of vectors um, actually follows the left hand rule. Okay? So whatever it uh, and interchanging two rows multiplies the determinant by a minus 1. So um, the sign of the determinant uh, seems to be just uh, recording whether your vectors, or whether the uh, vectors that make up the rows, are uh, forming a, a right-handed collection of vectors or a left-handed collection of vectors. All right, so maybe that's one interpretation of what the sign of the determinant is telling us. Let's look at uh, multiplying a row by a constant. So if we multiply a row by a constant, Right. If we started with the identity, that's just going to replace the um, or multiply the what the ith the one in the ith position with the c, okay, and that multiplies the determinant by c. What does that do to the vectors? Well, it, it whichever the ith vector is, it just stretches that by a factor of c like this. Right, it makes it longer, or maybe shorter, if the constant is less than 1. Um, and actually, maybe it could also turn it around if the constant is negative. So what, what does that change? Well, one thing that that changes is the size of this box that these vectors are determining. Right? These vectors sort of they determine this box, 
right? And the original, uh, the standard basis vectors sort of determine a box with volume one, right? Because it's one, the standard basis vectors all have length one, and so every side length in this box is one. And of course, all the sides are perpendicular to each other because we have the standard basis vector, or the standard basis. So we started with a box with volume one, but we stretched it out by a factor of c in one direction. Um, well, that's going to multiply the volume of the box we started with by a factor of c. So the volume before this row operation and the volume after just gets multiplied by c. OK, uh, the, last, uh, the last elementary row operation is adding a multiple of one row to another, like this. OK, that it corresponds to having some factor off the diagonal like that. And uh, what does this do to the determinant? Well, it doesn't do anything to the determinant, right? The determinant here is still just one. The determinant here is one, OK? Um, and what does that do to our picture with these vectors? Well, adding a multiple of one to the other, let's take the vector on bottom. No, let's take the vector pointing up, and we'll add a multiple of the vector on bottom. It takes the, the vector that you're adding to and just sort of tips it towards the vector that you're adding, like this. Okay. So now our box is sort of leaning like this. Okay. How does that change the, uh, how does that change the volume of this box? Well, the box isn't, we, we have to be careful about how we're interpreting this geometrically. This box isn't actually falling flat like this. It's actually just sliding sideways, right? The vector, vector that we started with that was pointing up was like this. And we're adding a multiple of the vector on the bottom, so like this. It still it goes up the same amount as it used to, but now it also goes sideways some. So that's what a shearing operation does. It sort of slides it sideways, but without sort of collapsing it down at all. What does that do to volumes? Well, it doesn't do anything to volumes. Uh, it, it's sort of a little easier to see if we have a square so that the picture is a little easier. So if we shear this rightwards, it's still as tall as it used to be. Whoops, that's not the right picture. It's still as tall as it used to be, but now it also goes sideways some. Right? But still, for a parallelogram like this, the area is still the base times the height. And the base and the height are, sa are the same as for this square, and so it has the same area as the square. Well, the same thing goes for volume, uh, or even hypervolume in larger dimensional spaces. So, um, so a shearing doesn't actually change the volume. So what, what we're finding is uh, each one of these elementary matrices changes the volume of this box in exactly the same way as the determinant of that elementary matrix. In other words, if we start with this, this box built out of these vectors, um, the, after we do all these operations, the resulting volume is just the product of all of these determinants. And that gives us a really nice interpretation for what the determinant is telling us, right? So what we found is that the determinant of, of the matrix A is the product of all these elementary determinants of these elementary matrices. But now we know that this is the, um, this is the volume of the resulting sort of tipped over box. And a, a tipped over box is called a parallel pipette. Okay, so if we do all these elementary, uh, elementary row operations, which amounts to multiplying by all of the elementary matrices, the standard basis that we started with turns into one of these parallel pipeds, and the volume of this parallel pipeed is just the product of all of these element determinants of these elementary matrices, but that's the determinant of A. Okay, so the determinant, it's the size of the determinant is telling us how much the volume of this box gets expanded. And the sign of this determinant is telling us whether these vectors, whether the orientation or the handedness of these vectors is getting switched or not. Right? When the determinant is positive, we still have a right-handed 
uh, collection of vectors. And when the determinant is negative, we have a left-handed collection of vectors. All right, so this is a, a really nice property of the deter determinant. Notice that this also works in the first case where the, um, where the reduced row echelon form of the matrix has a row of zeros, uh, because uh, in this case, right, the determinant is 0, so the col columns of A or rows of A are linearly independent. But that means that they actually, the, the parallel pipe that they determine is actually flat. Right? If we had three, we would expect to have a sort of a three-dimensional parallel pipe ed. But if the columns are all linearly independent, then they actually all fall in a plane. And what is the volume of a parallelogram in a plane? Well, it's zero. So still, the determinant of still in this in this case where the determinant is zero, it's still telling you the volume of the resulting uh, parallel pipe ed. It's just that the volume happens to be zero. All right. So you know, in general, if you have uh, if you have a matrix, then the determinant is the volume of the vectors uh, determined by a parallel pipe ed. Okay. Uh, although you know, the sign of the determinant does depend on whether the vectors become right-handed or left-handed. As an example, let's just find the volume of the parallel pipe ed determined by these vectors. Um, so here's what all of these vectors look like. And you can see we've, we're sort of, we get kind of a, a tipped box, right? All of the sides of this box are parallelograms, and opposite sides are parallel to each other, right? So this left-hand side is parallel to this right-hand side, and this front top side down here is parallel to that bottom side down, down there, and so on, OK? So that's when I say a a parallel pipe ed determined by some vectors or spanned by some vectors, this is what I mean. Okay. Um, so let's find the volume of, of the parallel pipe ed determined by these guys. Well, that's just the determinant. So we can just calculate the determinant of, we can take all these vectors and cram them all into a matrix. And then just calculate the determinant. Um, Let's go down the uh, last column, because there's a 0 in there. So uh, this is going to be plus minus plus. So plus 0 times whatever, it's 0, minus, and then minus 2 times the determinant of 1, 2, 2, 1. And then plus, for this last entry here, 1 times the determinant of uh, 1, 2, 2, minus 1. OK, so this is going to be 2 times, so this determinant is 1 minus 4, so minus 3 plus 1 times. And then this determinant is minus 1 minus 4, so minus 5. So minus 6 minus 5, that's minus 11. Okay? So this volume, the volume of uh, the parallel pipe ed spanned by these vectors is uh, 11. Okay? Also, these vectors in this order uh, are a left-handed collection of vectors. You'd have to use your left hand to point them, to point your fingers in the direction of the first, second, and third with your index, middle, and thumb. Right. If you tried to do it with your right hand, you'd have to, you'd, your thumb wouldn't point in the right direction. 